It's been two weeks since we were last in Leviticus, so I want to just begin our study this morning by reminding you that this ancient book, penned by Moses, largely through the dictation of the things the Lord said to him from the tabernacle of meeting, can really be broken down into just two simple sections. So two sections for the the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 17, discusses the way a sinner had to approach a holy God. Within the rest of the book, chapters 18 through 27, unpacking how that person should then live in light of this new relationship that they had with God. You might say the first half of Leviticus establishes the precedent for grace before then explaining all of the ways in which God's grace really does change everything. It's our blueprint. Now with that in mind, not only does it make logical sense that this first section of Leviticus begins with, well, seven chapters detailing for us a system of sacrifices to be made before the Lord at the tabernacle. But it's worth noting that everything in the book, not just the sacrifices, but everything initiates following the burnt offering. Now, in case you weren't with us in our exposition of Leviticus 1 and the burnt offering, the key to understanding this particular sacrifice, it's really found in Leviticus 1 verse 4. If you'd look there just briefly, we read that the offerer shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and then notice, it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Before anything, could, anything else could happen, Between the sinner and God, atonement, literally in the Hebrew, a covering for sin was required. It was demanded. It was the first thing and initiated all others. In a much larger sense, the burnt offering presents for us a perfect illustration of a concept central to our comprehension of the book itself. You see, Leviticus with all of its rites and rituals and laws and instructions and mandates and demands and edicts and traditions, Leviticus never intended to work, but only to establish the framework by which God would work. In fact, in Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul will describe the works of the law, the things we find here in Leviticus, as actually being A curse. He calls it a curse. Why? Because no one could actually effectively obey them. You know, a sad commentary of the Old Testament history of the Hebrew people is that you'd be hard-pressed to find more than just maybe one or two examples of the people actually attempting to take the instructions we find in Leviticus and apply them to life accordingly. Most of the time, they paid no mind to the things we find in Leviticus. Pertaining specifically to the burnt offering, we read in Hebrews 10 verse 4 that it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. The New Testament authors are clear and consistently so that there's never been a sacrifice that any sinful person, man or woman, could offer that would actually make that person, that individual, right before God. To this very point, in Galatians 2, verse 21, Paul will again write very plainly that if your righteousness could come through the law, basically, if your obedience to the mandates articulated in Leviticus would make you right with God, if that was possible, then Paul says Jesus would have died in vain. It's heavy language. Again, Leviticus never intended to work but only to establish the framework by which God would work. Now, if you're tracking with me this morning, this idea leaves for us an important and rather pressing question. If it's never been possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, then what exactly was God seeking to accomplish by demanding the burnt offering of so many bulls and goats? Kind of like the bulls and goats get a get a raw deal out of it. Not only, by the way, is this an honest question, if you're looking at these things, but your answer to that question really reveals two things. It reveals how you actually view God, and two, it reveals how you you see or perceive the true nature of the gospel message. We noted two Sundays ago that every aspect 
of the rituals associated with you coming to the tabernacle of meeting to make this burnt offering before a righteous God was designed to illustrate three important truths about what atonement really demanded of you. What, it, what your sin really required. For your sin to be covered, for you to experience forgiveness, for you to be right with God, to enter into a relationship with your creator your sin separated you from, for you in the process to be made whole, to be made complete, to experience a recreation, a rebirth, First and foremost, what we learn in the burnt offering is that God, for those things to be accomplished, would have to offer a sacrifice of incredible cost. Again, I'm not going to repeat all of this. You can refer back to the last study. But God would have to offer, to make atonement for your sin, a firstborn male from his flock. Secondly, Because the only effective sacrifice that could permanently satisfy the righteous demands of your sin, the requirements your sin demanded, human death, we see that the only perfect blameless man to have ever lived, Jesus, would have to endure something ghastly. The burnt offering teaches us God would have to offer something costly. Jesus would have to endure something ghastly. And this is illustrated in the burnt offering. To atone for your sin, Jesus, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, would have to be slaughtered, butchered, mutilated, killed, his blood drained and spilt. That's what your sin required. But finally, when it was all said and done, this process for atonement necessitated only one thing of the sinner. Simple. You have to place your faith and the fact that God promised he would accept a sacrifice. The sacrifice of his son for your sin on your behalf. Again, we go back to verse 4. It all began when you put your hand on the head of the burnt offering. And then what does God say? It will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement. The only guarantee that you have at all is a promise God made, articulated through His Word, that He'd accept it. Now, I I reiterate all of this because the burnt offering, from the more macro perspective, had nothing to do with you coming before God in order to consecrate yourself. Or for that matter, offering yourself as a living sacrifice. So many people teach chapter 1 in that vein, and in the process, they muddle the picture. Instead, the process of this burnt offering intended to illustrate for us the sacrifice God would willingly offer for you to atone for your sin. Not so that you could be a living sacrifice. He gave a sacrifice so you could be alive. It's a powerful picture that you might find life in Him. Leviticus. It's all about God creating a new people. He's liberated slaves from Egypt. Now he's imparting to them at the tabernacle of meeting, following Sinai, a new identity. They were to be something different. They were to contrast the world. Which explains why before God says anything else, he begins Leviticus with a burnt offering. Why? To establish the framework by which Jesus could make atonement. For our sin as the spotless Lamb of God. Leviticus begins with God making a sacrifice so that you could be part of his family. So that you could be part of his people. Our our new identity is only possible because of his sacrifice and never one we make on our own. Now, it's not an accident that directly following the burnt offering... God transitions to something interesting. The minha offering, as it is in Hebrew. Now, in the old King James, this is translated, the minha offering, as the meat offering. The New King James, the version that I use, uh, it's referenced as the grain offering. In other modern translations, maybe the one in front of you, it ends up being presented as the meal offering. This Hebrew word minha 
It, it literally means gift or tribute, oblation, present. For our purposes this morning, regardless of how you label the sacrifice, meat, grain, meal, the nature of this second offering articulated in Leviticus 2 is that it was to be a response to God. It was a response offering to God for His work articulating your thankfulness and your gratitude. Now, isn't that beautiful? God offers a sacrifice we could never make to atone for sin, and then he immediately He's like, hey, this is how you can respond to me for that. It, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Following God's sacrifice of grace he proceeds to explain to us how now we can offer a response of thanksgiving. As we did with the burnt offering, let's read this section in its entirety before unpacking it. So Leviticus 2, we're going to do the whole chapter here. It begins, When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, one of whom shall take from it his handful of fine flour and oil with all the frankincense. And the priest shall burn it as a memorial offering on the altar, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering shall be the priest. It is a most holy offering to the Lord made by fire. Now, God continues by explaining the three different ways this grain offering could be prepared and cooked. Verse 4, And if you bring as an offering of grain, an offering, and look at it, baked in the oven. So that's the mechanism. It shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Verse 5, But if your offering is a grain offering baked in a pan, this would literally be a flat kind of open air plate, what we would think of as a griddle, It shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. Verse 7. If your offering is a grain offering baked in a covered pan. This is a third uh, means of, of preparation. This would be like a fryer. It shall be made of fine flour and oil. Now, depending on how the flour was cooked, God gave variances here for all of the preparations. The way you cook things develop different tastes, whatnot. Continuing, you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord, and when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. Verse 9, Then the priest shall take from the grain offering a memorial portion and burn it on the altar. Now the whole offering here is not consumed, only a portion. It is an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And what is left of the grain offering shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a most holy offering to the Lord made by fire. Verse 11. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. As for the offering of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma. This first fruit seems to be a subcategory of the meal offering. More details will come in a moment. Continuing, and every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. God's very specific about salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Verse 14, if you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first Green heads of grain, roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it, similar to the earlier procedures. It is a grain offering. Then the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of its beaten grain and part of its oil, with all the frankincense, as an offering made by fire to the Lord. And it would appear the idea here of the first fruits was kind of to make a concession for how an offering was to be prepared if the grain itself was still green. Like it hadn't had time to season, had you're in a rush, you're you're pulling heads off the off the stalks. Uh, It's green, it's not ready to be eaten, it's not really ready to even be prepared into fine flour. So there's kind of this concession for how that was to take place. Now before we get 
into the specifics. Oh, man, so much. Good stuff here. And unpack all the interesting details of the text, for there are many. It's helpful if we first, well, let's contrast the grain offering with its predecessor, the burnt offering, for just a minute. First, you will notice in chapter 2, the word atonement, it's never mentioned, right? It's totally absent from the text. In fact, the sacrifice here of this meal offering, it's void of any blood, no blood at all. Offering one, very bloody. Offering two, not so much. Along that thread, you'll notice that there's no animals here included. And instead, what's offered is directly tied, and this is interesting, to human effort. It necessitates human involvement. Whether or not the grain here manifested from the first fruits of your crop, you harvested it from your fields or you just purchased it, it was here in the grain offering incumbent upon the individual to prepare the offering. There was quite a bit of work that you had to engage in before you ever came and made the offering. Aside from this, the inclusion here of an oven or a pan or a covered pan meant the offering, well, it could be prepared by anyone. Really using whatever it was you had at your disposal. Within the variances of the burnt offering, we saw this already illustrated. A bull or a lamb or a goat or a bird. God wants to make sure, as with the burnt offering, that with the grain offering, this response, that you're not limited to, to, to making it from like any type of social uh, reasons or economic reasons. Like whatever you have to cook. Use that. That's kind of what's being articulated here. Now, I don't want to state the obvious, and this will be an obvious statement, but it's worth pointing out that it's not an accident the meal offering intentionally follows the burnt offering. Again, I know that that's not rocket science, but it's important. Like the ordering here of the offering, this following the first, suggests that God's sacrifice to make atonement on our behalf should yield a natural response in our lives back to Him. The order is important. God makes an offering you can't make. That should do something within you. Now, that, that being said, like the burnt offering, please notice, the grain offering, it's not mandated. Did you see that? It's what we call a free will offering, similar to the burnt offering. Now, the amazing thing about the fundamental nature of God's grace, demonstrated by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to atone for our sin, what makes grace so amazing is that God did a work for us without expectation. It's a free gift. Like God demands nothing on the part of the receiver. It's a gift free of attachment. God's favor apart from our merit. It's to be received. And by the way, enjoyed without the expectation of reciprocation. And yet, note how the passage begins. It does begin with the presumption that such an offering would naturally follow the burnt offering. Look again at verse 1, how it opens. When anyone offers a grain offering to the Lord. The assumption is that you're going to, if you really understand the burnt offering, it's not if you offer but when? It's going to happen. If you get the burnt offering, you understand the necessity now of this response. You know, religion demands a response to God's grace. It's how it warps it. And legalism, by the way, is all too willing to define what your response to God's grace should look like. But the real nature of grace is that it frees you of both a demand as well as an expectation of doing anything by doing something else really important. By creating within you a sincere desire to respond to God's incredible goodness. Not because I have to. Because why wouldn't I? You see, God's amazing grace should manifest from the receiver both a thankfulness as well as a desire to give back to Him in response to everything He's given for them. A mandate ends up being replaced with a desire, a desire to give. Uh, the command to serve is made null. Why? You don't have to tell someone to serve when they already want to. 
You see, God sees no need to demand a response from his people who have received his grace, knowing that your response to those things, if you really understand grace, should be natural, free-willed, and forthcoming. Now, what's interesting about all these specific details associated with the grain offering is that it, it communicates the fact that God deeply cares how you respond to his grace. Let me repeat that. God deeply cares how you respond to his grace. Again, God will go on the record here as to how grace should impact the way we interact with others. We'll see this in future chapters. But in this grain offering, God is doing something significant. He's telling us how we should respond to him in light of his grace. Meaning, don't miss this, there is a right and a wrong way to respond to God's grace. Now before we get to this, we are going to be looking at them through the New Testament. Like we have a different uh, perspective. Like We're going to look at them from a, an interesting lens. A lens that is post-Calvary, largely Gentile, within the church age. No longer possessing a tabernacle, we don't have a temple. The specific rituals here largely are irrespective of our cultural context. So with that in mind, before we get to the details, I want to just give you four examples as to what the grain offering is illustrative of concerning our Christian experience within the context of how we respond to God's grace. Again, not how we respond to others, grace working through us, but responding back to God. First, one of the most basic ways Christians naturally respond to God for His grace is through worship. It's through our worship. We, we did that this morning. In Hebrews 13, verse 15, we read, Therefore by Jesus, let us, and, and check this out, using Leviticus language, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the first fruits of our lips giving thanks to his name. You see the language tying here to Leviticus 2? So our worship is an appropriate way for us to respond to God. God's done so much in your life, and you come to church, and, 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 and there's worship, and you're raising your hands, and you're just exalting, and you're praying. This is a response, an offering tied to the, the grain offering. Secondly, there is also what's called the giving of thanks to God through our prayer lives. The Apostle Paul would exhort the believers in Ephesus to, quote, give thanks always for all things to God, the Father, and the name of our Lord Jesus. Ephesians 5, verse 20. I hope you know prayer. Aside from worship, your prayer life is much more than just coming to make requests of God. Our prayers should ooze a thankfulness for His grace. And so we, we, we can respond to God's grace through our worship, but then also just our prayer life. Coming to God and just thanking Him for what He's done and what He's doing. The third way is our service. Now, service, there is no question, as a response to grace, has an application to the way that we interact with others, undoubtedly. But according to Ephesians 6, there's an interesting component to our service. We're told that our service is actually to the Lord and not to men. Like taking it one step further, in Hebrews 13, verse 16, we're told doing good and sharing with others is actually, note, again, we're robbing from Leviticus language, a sacrifice that God is well pleased with. It's a grain offering to Him. So when you serve, it's not to others. Your service is ultimately to the Lord. And so we worship and we, we pray and then we serve. But lastly, one of the most basic ways Christians naturally respond to God for His grace is by giving. In 2 Corinthians 9 we read, He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, or of a necessity. Again, this is free will. But, the author says, Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Literally in the language, a hilarious giver. 
Well, giving to meet the practical needs of others ties into this as well. There is an application of giving of our material resources to the church itself that we should address. When you tithe to the church, not only are you expressing a thankfulness to God for all that He has provided you, but this is what's interesting. You're making that offering without a measure of control of the offering. You're letting go. Like in a profound sense, when you give to the church, you're giving as God has given. No strings attached. Now, I don't, this is not a tithing Bible study. We're not going to go there. But I, but I do want to say this, because I think it illustrates this point perfectly. There's a family in our church that gives handsomely and faithfully to Calvary 316. As their pastor, out of a sincere desire to demonstrate accountability, etc., a few months ago, just over dinner, conversation, I asked if they were interested in more of a detailed accounting as to how the church manages tithes and offerings. Their response was radical. Nope, they said. Our job is to give faithfully as a response to all that God has given us. Your job is to be a good steward. We'll both give an account of our roles when we get to heaven. Heavy. Now, getting back to the text. So there's four ways that we have our own response in a New Testament. We're not going to go and make like prepare some bread and give it to the Lord. The way we respond through worship, through our prayer of thanksgiving, through our service, through our, our, our giving, our tithes and offerings. Back to the text. As it pertains here to this response to God's grace, notice, God really cares, first and foremost, about the nature, the substance, the essence of the offering. Like the DNA, like where this is coming from, right? Verse 1, look again. He says, the offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Then in verse 13, God adds that every offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the, the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. For starters, we read how this offering should be of fine flour. Like the picture that's being presented here is that the flower itself should be void of any type of impurities. To accomplish that, you would have to take the flower after breaking it down and whatnot. You'd have to sift it. You wouldn't want to make sure that it's pure before you prep it, before you cook it. Now, there are those, when teaching this, that present the picture here of fine flour as God saying, that when you come, you need to give him your best. But I think that's a little off. Like keep in mind, flour, in a cultural context here, was a daily staple for everyone. Give us our daily bread. It was a daily provision. Bread, flour was so common that everyone, irrespective of class or economic status, had access to flour to make bread. Now, the implications of this response offering, being fine flour, I find to be incredible. You see, God wasn't asking anything, check this out, beyond what you already had at your disposal. So you're wanting to respond to God's grace, and God's like, just, just let's start with what you got that everyone had. Beyond that, you'll notice that the amount of fine flour wasn't specified at all. Which meant that the gift was to be totally proportional to what you had to give. Could be a little, could be a lot. It's what you had. Like how awesome that an offering to God in response to His grace doesn't have to be elaborate. For God to find pleasure in it. For Him to be blessed. While there is nothing inherently unique about the flour, this process, though, of sifting so that it became fine and pure, it designed to add a weight to its underlying significance. You're making bread for the family. You might not go through the full process. There might be a little bit, Mom, I got a twig in this piece of bread. I'll just deal with it, kid. 
but with, the, with, but with this offering, like you got to sift it. It adds some weight. There's some purpose behind it. So it's common, but there's a purpose. In a sense, I love this. It's as though God's saying, a response to my grace, guys, it doesn't have to be extravagant. Just intentional. I love that. Now, relating to your response offering, I hope you know you don't have to go big to be effective. As an example, let's say you're compelled to start giving. You're wanting to respond to all that God's doing, and you're like, I want to make this a part of my life. Like, you don't have to empty the bank account for God to be blessed. In fact, just some fine flowers, okay. Like, give in proportion to what you have. I love that. And like, if you're moved to serve, like, man, God, you've been doing so much in my life. Like, I just want to give my life. I, I want to be a servant to you. You don't have to sell everything and move to Africa to accomplish that. Like, in fact, you can start simple. You can come up to the church throughout the week and you can mow the church weeds. I mean lawn. Like, never forget when you're wanting to respond to all that God has done for you, He's okay with fine flour. God also says that the offerer here shall pour oil on it. So oil on the flour. Practically speaking, we understand olive oil is necessary in the cooking process. Not much is going to happen without the oil. Additionally, because there's no leaven to be added, and, and we'll unpack that in a moment, these unleavened cakes of fine flour, they need the oil to interact with the heat, to cook. Like no offering of any worth or any value could ever arise without fine flour first being mixed with oil. Now in Old Testament typology, oil was symbolic of anointing. Like anointing something with oil had a purpose. It separated something that was common, ordinary, and in the process of separating it, sanctified that person or thing for a, a reason, a purpose. In fact, the very first mention of oil in the Scripture goes all the way back to Genesis 28, when Jacob, who's fled his family, Esau wants to kill him, and he's, and he's crashing out, and he's worried, and he's sleeping, and he receives this heavenly vision. God articulating promises, not just promises that had been articulated to Abraham or promises to his dad Isaac, but now he's getting these promises for himself and he awakes and he's blown away by this. And what does he do? He stacks up some stones and he pours oil on it. He calls it Bethel. That's the first mention of oil. There was an anointing. From the sanctifying of the tabernacle, the sanctifying of all the tabernacle's furniture and utensils, the ordination of the priests, later the coronation of kings, olive oil was always used with this intention. It took what was common, made it distinct, separating it for the purposes of the Lord. Well, this here in Leviticus 2, this is our first encounter with oil in the book. You'll note that you'll find oil referenced another 42 times in 36 verses. Now, relating to the anointing. Because of that, the oil has also become symbolic of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon an individual's life was illustrated through the anointing of oil, as just one of many examples. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, Saul's totally messed it up. God comes to Samuel's like, going to call out a new king. So he goes, he's got the house, calls out all the sons, going on down the line, nope, 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 runs out of kids. Is there another son? And the father's like, yeah, there's a little scrawny kid out tending sheep. He didn't even invite him, didn't think you'd need him. And up comes running this red-haired, vibrant-eyed kid named David. And, and then we read that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And then we're told the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So, so the picture here, fine flour mixed with oil, it, the, what's being articulated, it's kind of twofold. There's a twofold symbolism to it. Like on one hand, adding oil to flour was a way to take the common, what you had in your hand, 
you're simple. Anointed as being special. This is not just normal flour. This is sanctified. Separating it for God's specific purposes. This is my offering. Beyond that, we also see within the picture this profound truth that any response to God's grace necessitates the involvement, the infusion of His Holy Spirit. You see, the blending of oil with the flour illustrates how our common offering, what we have to give, becomes sanctified as the ordinary is mixed with the divine. Our simple gift becomes infused with supernatural power. That fine flour, when we add the Holy Spirit, it's cooking now, literally. Oil was such an essential component to our response to God that God would accept no offering without it. (laughs) Have you ever been overwhelmed by God's grace that in response you give back to Him with something that you have? Now, admittedly, it's not much. It's your fine flour. But you notice something happens. Something supernatural occurs. Have you ever seen God take that little you gave, infuse it with His Spirit, so that it ends up yielding more than you ever thought possible? You want to know the law that dictates that? Right here in Leviticus 2. But that's not all God wanted added. He says frankincense should also be added to the flour, the oil. Frankincense, it's an interesting thing. I probably spent too much time researching frankincense this week. It's a white resin. And and when it's crushed, it emits a wonderful fragrance. The first mention of frankincense we find in Exodus 30, verse 34. When God gave Moses the recipe for the incense that was to be burned upon the altar of incense in the tabernacle to fill the space with an aroma of heaven. Now the idea behind the inclusion of frankincense and this response offering is that the entire purpose of the offering was to do what? God's already gone on the record saying that, man, I really dig the smell of frankincense. Matter of fact, my whole tabernacle, I want filled with the aroma. So now you're going to be offering something, and God's like, fine flour, oil, but man, I love frankincense. Just put some frankincense on it. Meaning what? Meaning that the entire point of the offering was to bless God. God loved frankincense. You're like, man, I hate frankincense. But you know what? This isn't for me. It's for God. As these flour cakes burn on the altar, the aroma of frankincense mixing with the smell already permeating the the tabernacle. Well, we're told very specifically that it created a sweet aroma to the Lord. Literally, again, an aroma of rest. God would exhale. I wonder if he thought about the gift of frankincense that would be given to his son Jesus. You know, it's really tragic, but this point ends up being where so much of our response offerings, whether it be our worship or our prayers or our service or giving, kind of fall short of the ideal. Like so often, we bring offerings to God in response to His grace. But deep down, our intentions are self-seeking as opposed to being God-pleasing. Have you ever judged the time of worship, like the success of the worship set, upon the experience you had or didn't have? It's an offering without frankincense. Or or when our prayers end up being relegated to nothing more than a laundry list of demands as opposed to an opportunity to thank the Lord for what He's given. 
man, can't you be thankful for what you have? You're constantly just asking for more. Or we serve, not as a response, but we just want to gain power or status or influence. Or we give financially, but if we're honest, there's deeper strings attached. Never forget the purpose of such a response offering. If you want to interact with God in response to all that He's given you, season it with frankincense. Because it's not about you. It's about Him finding pleasure in it. It's about Him enjoying these things. Which is likely why God wanted every part of the offering seasoned with salt. Like Not only does salt serve as a preservative, but it also acted as a purifying agent. Like in ancient times on the battlefield, salt was instrumental in field dressing. Salt, you pour a, fill a wound with salt and kill bacteria. Keep the wound from getting infected. It's why if you're dealing with acne, go to the beach. Spend some time swimming in salt water. It'll clear that baby right up. It's a preservative, but it's also a purifying agent, which I take solace in. I love this. I love the picture. because, And maybe I'm just unique in this. Maybe you can't relate to the point I'm about to, about to say. But, but I find that it's very difficult, hard, to completely remove the ill intent of self from any offering I make. Man, self, it's got its tentacles everywhere. And yet what I love is God's like, fine flour, oil, frankincense, it's about me, but you know what? Just dump a bunch of salt on it too. Why? It's as though we come and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm coming before you. My sincere desire is I want to bless you. I want you to be pleased. But I also don't trust my own heart. So to preserve it and to purify it, I'm just pouring salt. Keep me out of it. You know, beyond this, the flavor of salt also served as a reminder of the covenant that God had made with his people. Leviticus 2, verse 13, we said, You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. Which, again, I love this. And covering the offering in salt, what you're doing is that you're intentionally reminding God of something important. It's as though you're saying to God, Don't forget, hey, this is a response to your grace. Uh, I'm covering it in salt because every bite you take, I want you to be reminded of the fact that like this whole arrangement that you and I have is based on your promise and not my ability to keep them. I'm going to fail a lot, so I need every bite to have salt so that you're just always reminded, yep, it's about my promises to him and not about his ability to keep his end of the deal, which again, I love. It's almost like in, in the response to God's grace offering, you're reminding God that I need more of His grace. Aside from these things, what should be included, God also articulates what should be excluded. Verse 11, He says, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in the offering to the Lord made by fire. Now within the Scriptures, leaven tends to be a picture of sin. Adding yeast to the flour, what does it do? It makes the bread delicious. But it causes it to rise, right? Or you might think just carrying the symbolism to puff itself up. Like leaven, it's an additive. It's symbolic of corruption, sin, pride. And the application of keeping our offering void of those things is rather straightforward. But what I find interesting is that God also excludes something else. Did you notice it? Honey. I don't want any honey. You want a lot of salt, but no honey. You see, honey was prohibited because in this culture, it was an artificial sweetener. It was an artificial sweetener. You, it was, you added it to it to make it sweeter, but it wasn't sweet in and of itself, so you added honey. You covered it in honey because it was, eh, without the honey. Honey, also you should note, breaks down when it's heated. It doesn't stand up. It doesn't last. And again, this is, honey turns to sour. It's sweet, but it's artificial, and so when it's on high heat, it, it, 
It doesn't have its intended, its intended purposes. Like, please know that God wants your response to His grace to be real. In fact, He doesn't want anything about it to be fake or artificial. Exclude it. Be genuine, real. Now, the idea of this response offering benefiting the priests, it's significant. We read verses 9 and 10, The priest shall offer of the grain offering a memorial portion, burn it on the altar. What is left of the grain shall be Aaron's and his sons. Now, we're going to address that whole idea in future studies. So for this morning, as we seek to close, I'm going to take a totally different angle, and this excites me. On three separate occasions, in Leviticus 2, God will instruct the lion's share of this response offering to be given to Aaron and his sons after a memorial portion is offered to the Lord. You notice that. You picked that up. So you went through this whole process of making this whole meal, and you bring it, and Aaron and the priests... They take it, they take a little bit, they put it on the altar, and then they keep it. Okay? So so that's the structure. Memorial portion of God, we keep the rest. It's a response to God's grace. It's demonstrated in the burnt offering. Yet the majority of your response ends up doing what? Blessing the high priest and his family. Now, I can hear some of you thinking, "Uh uh-oh, Zach's about to set us up for a shakedown. No, not at all. I know some of you are thinking it. Again, I'm so excited about this. We, well, we're the church, right? We're not Israel. We don't meet with God at a tabernacle. Instead, we're living temples filled with God's presence, right? It's true also our response offering to God looks much different than what's articulated in Leviticus 2. But, there is another major difference from our New Testament context. Unlike the nation of Israel, we no longer have or need priests. Why? Because we are priests. And Jesus is our great high priest, Hebrews 4. In fact, in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, the apostle writes, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Again, let me reiterate an important concept to Leviticus. Leviticus never intended to work, but only to establish the framework by which God would work. So don't miss that. Meaning Leviticus 2 is an incredible passage not only for the practical lessons that we've already addressed pertaining to the way we respond to God's grace, but don't miss this. Within the chapter, this chapter, right below the surface, we discover a spiritual principle that is radical. In fact, we discover a law of sorts that dictates the way in which God has ordered things to operate. According to Leviticus 2, when you respond to God's grace and make an offering to bless Him, what happens? First, God takes a memorial portion. He loves it. He savors it. Doesn't need anything else. But where does the rest of the offering go? It goes to bless Aaron and his sons. Or in our case, Jesus, the high priest, And his family of priests, which is who? It's you and I. Like, like we have a law here of how this was to be divvied. God would take a memorial portion, the high priest and the rest of the priests, they would be blessed by it. This law, it's a law, is why it explains why our offering to the Lord in response to his grace I don't know if this is your experience. It ends up boomeranging into being a greater blessing for us. Have you ever noticed that? You come before the throne and worship. 
seasoning your praise in salt, sincerely desiring to bless the Lord. That's what you want. But in the process of worshiping, something also happens, doesn't it? An experience meant to bless God comes all the way back around and blesses who? You. God takes a memorial. He's like, the rest is for the priests. You decide to serve as a response to God's grace by teaching the little rug rats in the kids' zone. You're not doing it for anything in return. But each Sunday you leave feeling like what? You came to give. It was your offering. And you leave just praying that they received just a portion of the blessing you received. You you go do missions and you leave and you're like, I just hope I bless them a fraction of what they blessed me, as if they took just a memorial. But then what happened? It boomeranged back to you. Like you choose to make giving, tithing, a priority in your life. You know you don't have to give, but you really can't figure out a reason you shouldn't. So you decide to give as a response to God's grace, starting with maybe your first fruits. But what happens? It doesn't take long for you to discover what Jesus said is actually true, that it really is more blessed to give than to receive. Like, like understand, we've all experienced this weird, fuzzy math. I don't get this. I'm trying to give God something. I seem to be getting more. Why is that? Leviticus 2 is why that is. Because God established a law for how you respond to him, and as part of that law, you receive the lion's share of the blessing. But, but it's the law. <laughs> you going to argue with him about it? Isn't God good? Isn't that concept radical? We receive a greater blessing from the offerings we make to bless God. And that happens because of the grain offering (laughs) in Leviticus chapter 2. It's amazing to me. I find it to be radical. And again, it's why we're studying this book, because it establishes the precedent for God's grace and how it changes everything. So, Father, Lord, we thank you for your word.